Good evening. Tonight, I'm going to read Psalm 118. It's on page 956. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look on in triumph on my enemies. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but the name of the Lord, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in, our hand, in hands, join in the festal pr procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Welcome all of you to our service here tonight as we think about a psalm that uh, plays so significantly in the life of Christ. Uh, many things in here are uh, resonating, especially during the uh, week leading up to Easter, but we think about that uh, probably as we uh, remember how they, this probably was one of the psalms that they sang when the uh, Lord's Supper was instituted and before they walked out to the Garden of Eden, or the, gar the Garden of Gethsemane, sorry. Um, but the call to worship comes from this psalm this evening where uh, he says, open for me the gates of righteousness I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. And then verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's bow in a moment of silent prayer. Our opening song is also based on Psalm 118. We'll be singing number 179, stanzas 1, 2, and 5, The Glorious Gates of Righteousness. The Glorious Gates of Righteousness. Please stand.
Lord Jesus Christ. Receive his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from Jesus his Son. Amen. You may be seated. We turn to our evening prayer. I'll ask if there are any requests for prayer this evening. We'll, uh, of course, remember Jay Lee and uh, the, uh, John and Pearl Sheepstra and um, the Meyer family, of course, but uh, there might be other things. Yes. I, I didn't quite hear Thomas. Thomas Oh, Thomas Kankidasan. Okay. 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 He's on oxygen. Okay. So that liver cancer is developing and getting worse. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, Linda. Thanks for the rain on dry ground. Yes, absolutely. We should not only ask for things, but be thankful, and we have a good reason to give thanks now for this rain. Yes. I'm thankful for 30 years of marriage with Mike on Tuesday, this oh. coming Tuesday. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> we'll pray for you, Mike. <laughs> This is Tuesday, okay? You were just a young couple when I first knew you. <laughs> You're still. <laughs> Anyone else? Shall we join together in prayer? We come to you tonight, Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, with grateful hearts that we can be back here in your house, in this church, with one another. We thank you for the bonds that there are between your people, that we desire to be here and to be in the presence of your word, the Bible, where we hear the message of the prophets of the Old Testament, the apostles of the New Testament, and where we hear of Christ our Savior and Lord. We confess that you are the great three in one, and so we confess that you are our Father. We thank you for hearing us when we pray and seek forgiveness. We thank you for the mercy that you show in sending Christ to this world and uh, in coming to us with the great plan of redemption that goes back to eternity, a plan in which we had nothing to say about our salvation, but you saved us and brought us to acknowledge that you are Savior and Lord. You brought us to repentance and faith. We thank you that uh, you have given us the tender mercy of many who have ministered the gospel to us. We thank you for mothers and fathers, catechism teachers, gems and cadet leaders. We thank you for our elders and deacons and pastors by which you have led us and given us the gospel of grace. We thank you for your providence, Father, for your provision of everything that we need for this life and for the next, for guiding and controlling uh, all the things that happen to us. And especially tonight, we give you thanks for this beautiful rain. We thank you that you have chosen to send this rain upon the dry ground. And we pray that it will get the soil ready for uh, all of us and for the farmers as uh, they are getting ready to put crops in the ground. We thank you for the hope and confidence that we have that you will, in fact, provide exactly what's needed for our crops, enough rain and wind and sunshine and the nutrients in the soil. We thank you for the many skills that have been developed to uh, create good conditions and to enhance the conditions for planting and growing. For all of these things are your gift. We confess, Lord, that you are God the Son, You've come into the world to be among us, to take on our human nature. We praise you, Lord Jesus, that we can look back now on the 
uh, weeks before Easter and leading up to the resurrection where you struggled in the Garden of Gethsemane and yet sought to do the will of the Father in heaven. We thank you for enduring such sorrow of soul and body and for gaining the victory over the evil one. Lord, we especially thank you for those reassuring words that were spoken to the thief on the cross. Today, you will be with me in paradise. And so our prayer is that you will remember us when you come into your kingdom. We pray that we may constantly walk with you and trust in you, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. We pray that you would work in us, Lord Jesus, that humility that you displayed when you took on human flesh and came into this world, that you gave up the glories of heaven, that you gave up that uh, heavenly glory without claiming it, even though you had every right to it. We thank you that you remained the perfect Son of God, but also came to be one of us in order to bear the guilt of our sin. Help us then to be willing to take the lowest place, to trust that you will do everything well. Help us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that you are at work in us to will and to do. And then we confess, Lord, that you are God, the Holy Spirit, the great comforter, the encourager, the paraclete, our advocate sent by the Father and the Son. And so we pray that your comfort will be given to every one of us in our sorrows and in our weaknesses. Again, we pray especially for Joyce Meyer and ask that you would give her strength in uh, dealing with the loss of Garrett. And we pray that you would comfort her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren in this loss. Comfort the members of our church as we have lost a brother in Christ that is, we have been able to be with over many years, and yet um, you have taken him now to glory. We pray that the word spoken yesterday may be written on the hearts of this family and of all of us so that the consolations of Christ may come, that we may know that our life is hidden with Christ at the right hand of God. May we constantly seek your work of grace in our own hearts. We ask that you will work um, in us to um, give us thankfulness for healing also when we're sick. And we especially bring before you uh, John and Pearl Sheepstra. We thank you uh, that we may commit them to your care. And we pray for healing and strength for John. Enable them both to trust in you and to, uh, in this time of such change in their lives, give them the assurance that you never do change, but you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We also bring before you J. Lee Vandekamp again, and we pray for her father and mother and all of her loved ones who care for her. We pray that you would give her healing. We pray that you will bless all the care that is being given and make it fruitful, and may her little body find strength that comes not from within, but from you, our great creator and savior and Lord. We remember also our brother, Thomas Kenkittisak, as he deals with cancer and as he's, his condition seems to be worsening. We pray, O oh Lord, that he may look to you also and may trust in you as savior and Lord. We pray that you will forgive his sins and give him the assurance of forgiveness. Give him a, a longing to be with you and to live in fellowship with his Savior. We also give you thanks for the great blessing of Christian marriage and for the marriage that you have given of 30 years to uh, Mike and Jen Bausma this coming Tuesday. We thank you for the joys that you have given to them in their four daughters and uh, in the marriages that they are uh, entering into and children given. We pray that the Holy Spirit will constantly give them joy as they count the blessings that you poured out upon them over these last 30 years. We pray that they will uh, constantly rest in your sure promises, that what you have begun in and through them, you will also carry to fruition and to completion. We pray that their marriage may be a mark of your grace in this world and a, a sign and a blessing to others in this church and in our community. We ask now that you will hear all these prayers, for we bring them in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The song of preparation is For the Glories of God's Grace, a hymn that is based on one of the beautiful texts in the Bible.
Bible that assure us that it is by grace alone that we are saved. We're going to open the Bible to a very sad book. So we just sang about God's good news that we would bring. And you might wonder sometimes when you're reading the book of uh, Jeremiah, that's the book we're going to open, uh, is there any happiness? Is there any good cheer in this book? And yet there is a book I have in my uh, study called Prophet of Hope. And he really is a prophet of hope, even though there is a lot of discouragement. And uh, he's known actually as the weeping prophet because there are so many tears in the message that Jeremiah had to bring. Um, he probably had to be the most miserable preacher you could ever have because he had to keep preaching to people that he knew didn't want to hear him. They didn't, they didn't want to listen to anything. He didn't, they didn't want to hear what he had to say, um, but yet he was called by God to be there. So we're going to turn to chapter 8, beginning at verse 18. Then we'll skip over to chapter 30 beginning at verse 12, and then there is a passage in the New Testament that uh, I believe fits very, very beautifully with this from Matthew chapter 4, the last part of Matthew chapter 4. So sorry you have to flip around so much in your uh, Bibles, but um, I think you will see that this may not be the, uh, there's a lot about the covenant in the book of, of uh, Jeremiah, but this is one of the key themes that we find in this book and uh, we can ask the question as he will, is there no balm in Gilead? Before we read, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that there are all kinds of means by which you bring your word, even through uh, prophets that had to be very miserable in their entire life and in all their ministry. We thank you for Jeremiah and for the words of hope that he brings us, and we pray that we will actually see that this evening as we consider the passages that are before us, and as we see them in the light of the New Testament. Hear us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah chapter 8, I'd love to read the entire chapter, but we're going to start at verse um, 18, where uh, um, he is, again, complaining, weeping. Oh, my comforter in sorrow. My heart is faint within me. Listen to the cry of my people from a land far away. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king no longer here, there? 
kind of an answer from God. Why have they provoked me to anger with their images, with their worthless foreign idols? People again, and jo jo Jeremiah speaking for them. The harvest is past. The summer has ended, and we are not saved. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn, and horror grips me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. Going over to chapter 30. Chapter 30 fits at least with this, beginning at verse 12. This is what the Lord says. Your wound is incurable. Your injury beyond healing. There is no one to plead your cause and no remedy for your sore. No healing for you. All your allies have forgotten you. They care nothing for you. I have struck you as an enemy would and punished you as would the cruel because your guilt is so great and your sins so many. Why do you cry out over your wound, your pain that has no cure? Because of your great Guilt and many sins, I have done these things to you. But all who devour you will be devoured. All your enemies will go into exile. Those who plunder you will be plundered. All who make spoil of you, I will despoil. But I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord, because you are called an outcast, Zion, for whom no one cares. And then this starts to blossom in the New Testament as we read from Matthew 4, verse 23. Matthew 4, verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to be especially uh, focusing on that question that we find in, uh, in chapter Eight, um, in verse twenty, chapter verse twenty-two of chapter eight, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? And then backing up to verse twenty, the harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. You probably know of people, or you have experienced it yourself. I'm quite sure you have, some of you, that uh, you're going to this routine visit to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, you've got cancer. That's going to have to come out. Have you heard that? I have. Uh, and it's kind of a, an alarming thing to hear. Uh, isn't there a better way to say it? But there really isn't, is there? Because you just have to be informed. You think, is this for real? Is, am I really hearing this correctly? A diagnosis of cancer for yourself or a family member, a, a friend or a loved one, it, it seems like a death sentence. And you have a thousand questions that come up as you think about it. Is this going to be mean chemotherapy for me, radiation, surgery? Is it curable at all? Is there going to be uh, chemotherapy? Are there going to be side effects forever that I'll be dealing with? And so many have, haven't they? We know that all too well. And if you do get rid of it, how easily will the cancer come back? There's that nervous edge that you're on quite often. And we ask, is there nothing that can be done? And you've had that. If, you, if you've ever been through this, or, and most of us at least have some connection with somebody who has, is there nothing that can be done? That was Jeremiah's question when the condition of the people of God in Judah was revealed to him. As I've alluded to, Jeremiah was given a very difficult assignment to preach to a people that would reject his message. 
He knew this going in, and he was reluctant in many ways, but he still had to do it. He was called by the Lord to preach a message of doom and destruction. He knew it wouldn't be easy, and it was not easy for Jeremiah. It, never, it didn't even end easily. In the end, they, uh, uh, God said, don't go to Egypt. And Jeremiah said, don't go to Egypt when they were trying to get away. The remnant that was left. And Jeremiah is taken by them to Egypt where he dies. Where he doesn't want to be at all. And he knows that it was wrong for them to go there. But they take him there. They force him to go. So he asks this question in verse 22. Is there no balm in Gilead? He's deeply grieved. And he's known, as I said, as a weeping prophet. And he asks it because of that severe diagnosis that we also read in verse 20. The harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. So I want us to consider this evening Jeremiah's prophecy as we combine words from chapter 8 and from chapter 30 and then see, look ahead to what the prophet pointed to. So we're going to consider this evening an alarming condition, first of all, and we'll see that in chapter 8, then a fatal diagnosis in chapter 30, and then a mighty healer in uh, part of the, in chapter 30, but also in Matthew chapter 4. The alarming condition is described in language that is familiar to any farmer. The wheat harvest, the harvest is past, he says. The wheat harvest would produce a grain crop that lasted from April until June. The rest of the year depended on that wheat crop, and the people would expect, expect to survive, at least with having a supply of wheat on what that crop produced. But in Jeremiah's case, or in Jer as Jeremiah describes it and uses this example, the trouble is the harvest is past and there has been a complete crop failure. There's nothing. And the prophet is not necessarily speaking only of a literal harvest, of course. There is a threat from judgment from surrounding nations. And if you go back up to verses 14 through 17 of chapter 8, um, you can see what was going to happen to them. Uh, they dream, probably, by this fall, after harvest, the Egyptian forces are going to come and march against Nebuchadnezzar. The trouble is that they are being attacked by Nebuchadnezzar, who was going to carry them away uh, into their uh, 70 years of captivity. But all along, they're trusting that Egypt is going to come through for them. They're going to have an ally in Egypt. So here they are between Nebuchadnezzar and Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar is surrounding them. He's going to be coming. But they're thinking, oh no, the Egyptians are going to come and rescue us. We would say, futures are good. The war between Russia and Ukraine will end. The Hamas war in Israel will be ended. There will be an end to that. China will keep to itself. Prices will go down and we'll all be fine. Everything's going to work out okay. That's what they were trying to tell themselves. They would count on the harvest. They would count maybe on summer fruit. That would be found from July to October. And usually there would be grapes and figs, olives. But in this case, again, there's been a complete failure, even of the summer fruits. If you look at 8 verse 13, you see that the summer fruits have failed too. And Jeremiah, therefore, points out in a very heart-wrenching language, the hopelessness of Judah's situation. The harvest is past, the summer is over, and we have not been saved. You can't count on Egypt, is his point. The attack of the enemy is sure to come. They won't be delivered. And so it is that Jeremiah weeps, and we read his, the opening verse of chapter 9, where he's so heartbroken. Oh, that my head were a spring of water. And my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. Jeremiah truly weeps as he has to preach the message that is no fun to preach. Now we all place hope in human progress. Today especially, we're very impressed with moving forward and not being left behind. We want to have a progressive look. And we assume that things are always going to get better and there will be smarter and smarter inventions that we will have. That which is old-fashioned is only quaint and to be forgotten. What is new is what we actually desire. 
We've always lived with the idea that someone somewhere is going to develop a cure for cancer. And great advances have been made for cancer. Um, there's been, of course, a lot of help for pneumonia. And there's AIDS, and there's a lot of research on that. And of course, who can forget COVID-19? Uh, there is an appropriate surgery for heart disease. It may or may not help, but it often does. Uh, appendicitis can be taken care of. We've seen progress and amazing gifts in medicine. In our times, there's always somebody that seems to come through for us. Uh, some new invention, uh, some air force, a smart tactic. We even have smartphones, don't we? And uh, you might have seen pictures displayed, uh, as I've seen it from time to time, I think on uh, Facebook, that um, there's, uh, there, there's a, sh a shelf in a store with all sorts of radios and equipment, headphones and whatnot. And you, this, this used to be in stores that took up several shelves, and it's all found just in your smartphone. You can, you can have everything. Your computer, uh, basically it is a small computer. I remember uh, b hearing, I was told this uh, very often, that uh, finally in 1945, a year after I was born, telephones came to Beaver Creek, Minnesota. Telephones, of all things. They could have a telephone, a good crank, and you could call up somebody. So my dad had never seen me. He was in World War II in Germany, and he was on his way home. I was a year and a half old, and he called. And that was a, an amazing thing. They could, they could actually get a phone call from somebody who was way off in Wisconsin. He had landed in Wisconsin that far. Uh, but now, of course, if you can't just poke a button and find somebody in California or maybe even in uh, Canada or France or wherever you want to talk to somebody, you can do it. It might cost you a penny or two. We often think, though, that we depend on the technology, don't we? We're going to smart outsmart the enemy in espionage and war. Um, we don't have arrows anymore. Uh, we don't have stone-throwing devices. We've got bombs, and we've got uh, stealth bombs, and we have spacesuits, and we have uh, enemies of mass destruction. We have all kinds of things like that. Well, that's all true. We have all these things. But the trouble is that sometimes our expectation for progress includes spiritual power and church life. And we think that if we've made advances in all these other areas of life, we'll just do nothing but make advances in church life. All you have to do is tune in to the right expression. We assume if you can't find spiritual power on your own, you can probably call it down with some high emotion and high energy. We assume that all the present ideas will someday be old-fashioned. We assume the church will make new decisions that rest on new doctrines and will leave some old ideas and old doctrines behind. And a lot of people operate this way. They figure that whatever is old can be thrown out, whatever is new, well, that's probably right and going to be truly helpful. Now, I'm not asking for us to be uh, not resting on the development of, of Christian doctrine in, uh, in throughout the history of the, of the church. But the assumption that there will always be something new and that we will leave behind something, the old gospel of grace, is a tremendous error. It certainly is not going to build up the body of Christ to lose its foundation. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes in the New Testament that we need to guard the good deposit that has been given to us and that we have, been, been, have, in, have inherited and it's been entrusted uh, to us. And especially the leaders of the church are called to do that. Um, but we get used to that and we think, well, something new will come. But what does Jeremiah say about the idea that you cannot stop progress in religion? You can't stop progress in something, finding something new. Uh, what about um, God, the assumption that God will always give them a great harvest? What about that? We, we ask that question. Sadly, the hopes of the people in Judah could be summarized in that, the words of verse 20. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we're not saved. So that brings us to this fatal diagnosis that we find in our chapter and also in chapter 30 of the book of Jeremiah. 
the reality is that Judah is in great danger. Jeremiah has to convince the people of Judah that God is serious. The earlier part of the chapter describes the danger they're in, like a lawsuit and a sentence that's been given to them. He stresses that his people haven't returned to him. If you look at at chapter 8 in the part we did not read, there are some very interesting things there. If you look at uh, verse uh, 6, I have listened attentively, but they do not say what is right. No one repents of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Each pursues his own course, and here he has some interesting comparisons. Like a horse charging into battle, even the stork in the sky knows her appointed seasons, and the dove, the swift, and the thrush observe the time of their migration. And then here's the devastating application. But my people do not know the requirements of the Lord. And so he admonishes them. How can you say we are wise? We have the law of the Lord. When actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely, the wise will be put to shame. They will be dismayed and trapped since they have rejected the word of the Lord. And that's the real issue. They have rejected the word of the Lord. And so God says he will send poisonous snakes among them and their bite will be fatal. Verse 17. He singles out three aspects of their sin. And we, we noted, could, went over that, but let me just sum, summarize them. First of all, the leaders have lied. If you, verse 13, um, they dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. They claim peace and prosperity when there is no peace and prosperity. The second thing is they have lost their shame. Verse 12. Are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. Abraham Herschel observes in his book, Who is Man?, that the loss of embarrassment in a society is a huge step towards the loss of even being human. If you you can't be embarrassed anymore, you have really declined in your understanding of what it is to be human. And isn't that what we see in our own time? We see this all around us. People are, they're, they're do, they do things that normally you would say, that would be, you didn't want to be connected with that. But it's out in the open, bold-faced. They can't even uh, be embarrassed. And then their faith in verse 13 has not produced any fruit. There's no grapes on the vine. I'll take away their harvest. There are no figs on the tree. The leaves will wither. What I've given them will be taken away from them. And therefore, he summarizes it all that their hopes are in vain. The summary of of all of this uh, uh, description of things, their hopes are vain. They cannot count on something else to save them. They cannot think that they're going to be rescued. What they think, what they thought would never happen uh, is actually going to happen to them. They trusted that God's business was always to be present with them and to protect them. They had kind of an insurance card because they had a little religion with God. They could hold on to that. No matter what their beliefs and actions, they still had God. They had the temple. Chapter 7 talks about the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. It was the thing that they counted on. You could rub this magic rabbit foot and God would come through for them. But here are the, the sad words of verse 20. We are not saved. That's the force of all of this because sin finally takes its toll sin escalates it becomes more complex and it has not been eliminated and how did this apply in judah we ask and how does it we ought to ask also how does it apply today in judah sin had festered and developed until they finally were not embarrassed about anything and now god would send in enemy troops Chapter 9, verse 3 says, falsehood and not truth prevails. What about in our own experience? Don't we see also that sin develops and festers and results in a lack of fruit? We experience this personally. We struggle with indwelling sin ourselves. We experience this in our nation and throughout the world. And this seeps into the body of Christ when we're not watching or thinking clearly through the centuries Sin seems to take advantage of progress and lures us easily. It takes advantage of the situation we're in where we have so many blessings, so many things that we can, so many tools that can help us. And yet, um, 
we have things that introduce rot and putrefaction in our lives. It's, it smells, and we don't, uh, we're shut off from our minds and our souls are shut off from heaven because of all the things that we're blessed with that we turn to instead of the true God. And that's when he describes in chapter 30 that the wound is fatal. The prophet expresses God's pathos at the state of his people. The prophet isn't cold and calculating. And that's why he asks in chapter, going back to chapter 8, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? And what does the prophet mean? What does Jeremiah mean? It was simply this, that everybody knew that there is balm in Gilead. There was a certain kind of tree, and you could take the sap from that tree and make a kind of balm, a, a, a salve for people. Everybody knew that if you wanted to go to, uh, to get healing salve, all you had to do was go to Gilead. So that's, it's, a, it's a rhetorical question. Is there no balm in Gilead? Of course there is. There are physicians that go there. They try to apply the salve to you. This resin that comes from these trees uh, will help you. And there were Midianite merchants, you might remember, who picked up Joseph. They bought Joseph from his brothers and traveled down to Egypt, and they were bringing balm. They were bringing salve to Egypt. Years ago, Dorothy and I traveled to uh, South Korea, and then we decided to take a side trip to Hong Kong. And we got to Hong Kong, and everybody said, you've got to go to the Tiger Balm Gardens. What in the world are the Tiger Balm Gardens? I've never heard of the Tiger Balm Gardens in my life till I landed in Hong Kong. Well, you had to go up a mountain, and there was a beautiful garden there, and it was a place where you could get Tiger Balm, a beautiful kind of balm that was supposed to be healing to all kinds of people. I don't know whether there was anything to it or if it was superstitious or not. We, didn't, uh, we were not the suckers that bought it. We, just went, we went there and looked at it, but uh, we didn't actually buy it. Um, but it was highly treasured in Hong Kong. But in Judah, everybody knew you could get balm in Gilead. It was, the, uh, it was just the very thing that you would always get. And uh, so here, the implication that the prophet is making when he asks this question, is there no balm in Gilead? The answer was no. There's no balm, no salve for this trouble, for this trouble that you're in. Then nothing's going to heal this condition. There is no balm in Gilead that will heal the soul sickness of um, the, the people of Judah. But doesn't that portray our human condition overall? A human race that has drifted from God. That this portrays the condition of the, of the church, the people of God even today. The church turns away from God and doesn't turn back. It's not just the world. We mentioned a little of that this morning. It's not only the, that we're concerned about the world. We're concerned about the church. The church doesn't want to hear the voice of God. The church doesn't want to proclaim what God actually is saying. And if that's the case, then even the balm in Gilead is never going to heal that kind of wound. And therefore, all hopes are dashed, and you have to say, we are not saved. And that's when the prophet weeps about all of this. And he's not hard-hearted about it. It's not like the prophet doesn't care about bringing such a miserable message. He does care. That's why the tears are there. The prophets were typically doing this. You go, go to the book of Hosea, uh, if you would like to look it up, it's Hosea chapter 11, uh, verse 8. And here is the, uh, uh, what we might say, a pathetic cry of God. The prophet there puts uh, the, the pathos in God. How can I give you up, Ephraim? Well, that was the ten northern tribes. How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? That's where th those people had received the judgments of God. How could God do that to his own people, he says there? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger. I will turn, and uh, nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim. God himself is deeply moved by what he knows he needs to do to discipline his people. Discipline is never easy. It's very devastating. It's gloomy. Is this where we have to end? Thankfully, Jeremiah's word is not the last word, and that's why I want us to turn to chapter 30, verses 16 and 17. But all who devour you will be devoured, 
All your enemies will go into exile. Those who plunder you will be plundered. All who make spoil of you, I will despoil. And here's really good news. But I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. Now God alone is the healer. Even Jeremiah doesn't end with this hopeless tune that there is no balm in Gilead. Because here are these words. And think of of what he says in verse uh, 12. This is what the Lord says. Your wound is incurable, your injury beyond healing. But then he adds in verse 17, but I will restore you to health. Who can do that? Could the prophet Jeremiah heal the people? No. Could they find help? They could try for that in Egypt, but it wouldn't work. Is there any other place where they can go only to God? I will restore you to health. I will heal your wounds, the Lord says here. Only God can heal this sickness because he is behind all healing. And uh, there is no other. But we find in the New Testament, there's an even greater uh, picture that is given to us of God the healer. Because God the Son comes into this world. And God the Son is the one who heals. He is the truly great physician who literally healed the sick. So turn again to Matthew chapter 4, and at the end of that fourth chapter, verse 23, it tells about Jesus going through Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news, healing every disease and sickness among the people. And it gives so many specific examples all through the Gospels of the healing that Jesus did. And then verse 24, news about him spread. Of course, if you're going to get, if if people are healed, the news spreads all through Syria. People bring him, uh, this is outside of the borders of Israel. People brought him those who were ill with various diseases, suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those with seizures, the paralyzed, and it says he healed them. Of course, the incurable wound is not merely a wound that's physical. Um, The healing in the New Testament was very physical. A withered hand, a 12-year flow of blood, fever, leprosy, a 12-year-old that had died is raised. Partly all of this is to convince us that God has the power for anything. God can do anything. But it doesn't stop there because Jesus is also the healer of the soul. The soul that has an uh, uncurable wound can be healed by the Son of God. Jesus, who came into this world and gave his life for us, can actually heal uh, those who are, whose souls are sick. And every one of us is in need of that healing. If the earthly Gilead in the area of Jericho has no balm that will heal, the reality is that our Savior becomes our Gilead who does heal. And he proves it by literally healing crowds around him. And the prophet uh, Isaiah says he heals all our diseases. Listen to Isaiah chapter 53. Beautiful and familiar words. He, uh, He surely took up our infirmities. He carried our sorrows. We considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him in this great line, and by his wounds we are healed. Not only physically, but our souls are healed by the application of Christ, the true balm, not from Gilead, but from heaven itself. The balm that comes from Calvary and his cross. By his wounds we are healed. And so tonight, God calls us to receive this mighty healer, God calls me uh, as a preacher, but all, every one of us, to receive this healer. It's one thing to come to the point where you realize you have no hope other than Christ. It's another one to actually receive Christ and to receive the healing that he brings. And this requires faith. It requires trust. You know, the people who bought the, probably the tiger bomb in Hong Kong had to somehow trust that it was going to do them some good. The people who got balm from Gilead had to trust that that that, that concoction was going to actually do them some good. We have to trust that what Christ has for us is going to do us some good. Well, what does he have? What is the salve that he puts on us? Isn't it his blood? Jesus' blood is shed for us at Calvary. 
His blood is poured out. Just like the offerings in the Old Testament where the blood was spattered against the altar, Jesus' blood was shed in order that we might be healed. And this takes faith. We have to trust in him, and it must be faith mixed with repentance. How can you believe if you haven't turned away from sin to God? How can you turn to God if you haven't also believed in him and trusted his word? So we need to embrace Christ with repentance and faith. So the cry of despair in chapter 8, verse 20 of Jeremiah, where he says, and we are not saved, can't end there for us. And the Bible doesn't, thankfully. For we know that while it's humanly too late, and there is no cure, and there's no healing apart from the Almighty. There is the Almighty. With the power of God, there is salvation. We worry about our nation. We worry about our government. We worry about how people think. They think such weird things, strange things in our times. And it seems like there's no cure. And there isn't as long as there's no church. But the church must be the church. The church has to proclaim this Christ who does heal, who is the one, who is the salve that we need. He comes with the shedding of his blood and his resurrection, of course, as we see on Easter. He is the one that we proclaim, and the church needs to proclaim this Christ if there would be any hope at all for our nation as well as for the whole world. The power of God will produce such fruit as is needed. So congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is a serious warning for every one of us here. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, I know it's spring, but we are not saved. So where are you in this matter? This is the question. Where are you and where am I in this matter? The hour is near and we need to turn and return to God and only then will there be fruit in our lives. But here's overwhelmingly good news, isn't there? Christ's bride, the church, constantly faces sin sickness, sometimes as individuals, but also collectively. The days of the judges and the weeping prophet Jeremiah are reflected in the church today in the 21st century. Over the centuries we have strayed, and yet we have returned, and yet God has always preserved his church. Even in the darkest ages, there was always a remnant of true believers. The mercies of our Lord Jesus Christ are offered to us. There is a balm, not in Gilead, but in Christ. There is a balm in, if you want to call it Gilead, a new Gilead. He himself endured not just pain and sickness, but even went all the way to death. He died so for our wounds. In his wounds are found healing, medicine, restoration. His word brings the true cure, who is Jesus. So is there no balm in Gilead? Well, maybe not in the Gilead east of the Jordan River. But there is on the hill Calvary, in the wounded hands and feet, in the pierced side of our Savior Jesus. And that is the balm that fully heals and brings eternal life. Let us come to him in prayer. Thank you, O Lord, for the assurance that there is this great salvation given through Jesus. We thank you that the words of the prophet were fulfilled, that you did come and restore the fortunes of your people and have compassion on your people. And you restored to health and heal us by means of the work of our Savior. We thank you that we have such a mighty Savior who literally did heal the sick and went around bringing that good news with him when he was walking this earth. We thank you that his power has not ended uh, when he ascended into heaven, but his power from heaven is still given to us. We thank you that you hear our prayers, that even when we pray for those who are literally sick, we may entrust them to you, either to heal them now or in eternity. And yet, Lord, we know that especially we need to be healed of the sickness of our souls, our rebellion against you, that, re that refusal to hear your word. So we pray that you will, through this message tonight and through all the messages that are proclaimed in this church, that you will heal the sin-sick soul. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's only one song we can sing right now, and that is...
of course, there is a bomb in Gilead. If you expand on Gilead a bit and make that our Savior, he is our Gilead. 494 is there is a bomb in Gilead. to say together the Apostles' Creed as we unite with the church all around uh, the world and in all the centuries who have confessed their faith in terms of this great creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our benediction is based on the words in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 19 and 20. People of God, receive his blessing. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.